Hello, I'm Peter Lavelle and I was lucky enough to be head of television production at London advertising agency Collett Dickinson Pearson Partners in the late 70s and early 80s, when, if you worked in advertising, London was the place to be and Collett Dickinson Pearson Partners was the agency you wanted to work for. So, welcome to a very personal take on CDP and a golden age of British advertising. This book was published in 2000. Everybody in the business is convinced that advertising must command the attention of those it seeks to influence by being innovative, relevant and memorable. But CDP was the first agency in Britain to act on this belief day in, day out. CDP's example changed British advertising and led it to become the best in the world. It sounds a bit boastful, doesn't it? But I assure you it wasn't, and I hope you'll soon understand why. I should explain that throughout its history, the agency produced thousands of press advertisements and posters of amazing quality and importance. But it's impossible to show them properly on this small screen, and anyway, we don't have the time. So we'll tell a little of the history through the television commercials that were so successful in their time, and I think so different to those we watch today. The CDP story starts in 1960, so don't be surprised if some of the material you'll be seeing is showing its age. 1960, a year in which a rather conservative, rather straight-laced, rather grey Britain was still feeling the after-effects of the Second World War. But there was a whiff of change in the air. Beyond the Fringe, a hugely successful stage show starring Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Jonathan Miller and Alan Bennett satirised conventional attitudes to royalty, and the armed services and government propaganda. The Beatles got going in Liverpool. Skirts were getting shorter, but advertising was stuck in a rut. Agency managements, which should have been showing some strategic vision, asking the awkward questions, pushing the boundaries, preferred instead to defer to their clients. And clients, of course, are cautious. The result? was advertising that was correspondingly unadventurous and rather dull. On the other side of the Atlantic, however, a number of small New York advertising agencies were rewriting the creative rulebook with advertisements that were clever, witty and challenging. This was exciting. News travels fast in advertising and before long, creative people in London were itching to do the same. But the cautious, suffocating mindset prevailing at the time meant they stood little or no chance. This was a huge disappointment to John Pierce. Pierce had enjoyed great success as a publisher with the Eagle comic for boys. The Eagle was a publishing phenomenon, read by every schoolboy in the country and selling over a million copies a week. But Pierce was restless and joined an advertising agency as an account director because he thought advertising would be more exciting. It wasn't. For such an ambitious and dynamic man, this was desperately frustrating. So one evening, over a few whiskies with his old friend Ronnie Dickinson, he poured his heart out. Well, said Ronnie, you better start your own agency. And together, the two of them did. They bought Pictorial Publicity, a failing agency owned by John Collett. Some very dull accounts were shown the door, and the Whitbread Beer and Harvey's Bristol Cream Sherry accounts were taken on. So, on April Fool's Day 1960, Collett Dickinson Pearson Partners opened its doors. Nineteen years later, viewers watching the popular Evening News at 10 programme were treated to this.
Remember, that wasn't shot yesterday, it's nearly 40 years old. It was a breathtakingly bold advertisement directed by Hugh Hudson of Chariots of Fire fame. The press called it science fiction set to Puccini. It filled the entire two minute break in the middle of the news. Not just once, but every night for a week. Word of mouth spread like wildfire. Viewers even changed channels at 10.15 to watch it. It was nothing less than a sensational coup d'etat from an agency at the top of its game. Some say it's the best commercial ever made. If it was, it was 19 years in the making. So let's go back to 1960 to see what made CDP tick and how the agency developed. From the beginning, the partners were determined to produce advertising that was inspirational, enterprising, and most of all, noticeable. They were a good team. Pierce was a great strategist and a superb salesman. Collett, a little older, played the senior statesman role, reassuring clients who found Pierce's penchant for dramatic presentations and the long hair and flowery shirts of the creatives a little bit unsettling. Dickinson knew all about finance and media. The fourth cornerstone was the creative director, Colin Millward. All Colin had ever wanted to be was a fine artist, and at the end of the war, at the age of 21, a trained pilot, he returned home to Leeds and Leeds College of Art, where he won a coveted scholarship to L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. He duly lived in a garret on stale baguettes and cheap wine, becoming in the process a very good painter. Penniless when he returned to London, he answered an advertisement from a London advertising agency's media department, who said they were looking for somebody well-versed in all media. Colin thought they meant oils, watercolour and pastel, but that's not what they had in mind. Fortunately, someone had the nous to steer him across the corridor to the creative department, where he was immediately given a job as an art director. Ten years later, Pierce invited him to join the fledgling agency. It was the perfect opportunity for Millward to apply his artistic talent to transform the look and quality of British advertising, which he did soon after they started with a series of press advertisements for Whitbread Pale Ale. Here is a typical example of the Whitbread campaign they inherited. Rather pompously, it proclaims what highly skilled and responsible brewers they are. And this is what Colin and his writer David Reynolds came up with. I'll read it to you. What the Duchess saw. Returning unexpectedly from a grouse moor, the Duchess peered through the keyhole and, good gracious, there was the butler helping himself to a bottle of his grace's whitbread. Was the duchess dismayed? Not a bit. She realised that those who spend a lifetime studying ducal habits must inevitably acquire ducal tastes, and in the dry, robust flavour of a whitbread is one of them. What's more, she knew that unlike a butler, a whitbread is comparatively easy to replace. So, quoting the family motto, Nihil non magnificat, which one can loosely translate as nothing but the best, she merrily asked him to bring up another bottle. Well, frankly, that seems pretty unremarkable to us now, doesn't it? But at the time, it laid down a marker that CDP was about to create good-natured advertising, advertising that didn't brag or shout or bore, advertising that made friends with readers. It came as a bolt from the blue. Pierce and Dickinson ran the business, and left the actual creation of the advertising to Millward, so it's impossible to overstate Millward's importance. He was a tough, no-nonsense Yorkshireman, a total perfectionist who took no prisoners when it came to judging his colleagues' work. He ruled the roost over a collection of some of the most talented, eccentric, unruly creative people in London. One morning, a particularly self-confident art director arrived at 11.30. You should have been here at 9.30, said Millward. Why? 
said the art director. What happened at 9.30? There were very few rules and very little organisation. All flowers were allowed to bloom as long as they bloomed brilliantly. It was a very British agency whose work was firmly grounded in British culture. Unfortunately, Dickinson soon discovered that pictorial publicity's books were in a far worse state than they'd been told. The situation was grim. They were soon £80,000 in debt, a huge amount of money in those days. But salvation was to come from an unexpected quarter. I should explain that in 1960, commercial television was in black and white and didn't even cover the whole country. So for advertisers, it was newspapers and magazines that really mattered. We're all used to the multiple supplements that come with our newspapers every weekend, but they didn't exist at all until the 4th of February 1962. That's when the Sunday Times launched its colour section. John Pierce, with his publishing experience and strategic vision, immediately saw the potential of this new medium and enthusiastically committed CDP's clients to advertising in it. Very few other agencies had Pierce's foresight, however, and held back. This wait-and-see attitude meant that CDP's advertisements dominated the magazine each weekend. So, almost by default, it became a showcase for CDP's work. Colin Millward engaged the best photographers in the world. No expense was spared. Helmut Newton flew in from New York for the Chemstrand campaign. This is Chemstrand flag. Black and tans and dome. Another American, Lester Bookbinder, flew in and shot the Clark's shoes campaign. A clean pair of heels, black beauty, and red leather, yellow leather. They're so stylish, you could run them today, couldn't you? Soon, clients all over the country were taking CDP seriously. The agency's competitors dismissed it as a trendy little boutique, only good for alcohol and fashion. But Pierce was convinced that where there was booze and fashion, fags would surely follow. Fags was the current slang for cigarettes. And that, I'm afraid, means I have to give you a health warning. It seems unthinkable to us that smoking was so natural and commonplace then. In the 60s, 70% of men and 40% of women smoked. They smoked everywhere. They smoked in the street. They smoked in restaurants. They smoked on buses. They smoked in trains. They even smoked in airliners. Tobacco advertising was everywhere too, and agencies competed enthusiastically for the business. So to understand the social mores of the 60s and the advertising that followed in the 70s and the 80s, we have to understand that either they didn't know any better, or if they did, they were happy to look the other way and take the money. Pierce, a heavy smoker himself, had no such reservations. He turned down approaches from several brands before taking on Benson & Hedges Special Filter, a small niche product from the Gallagher Company. You'll be interested to know that that was directed by young Ridley Scott, a very good example of Millward's insistence that clients invested in absolutely the best talent available. The best directors worked with much-loved actors and comedians. You've already seen that the world's best photographers had their choice of the world's top models. Nothing and no one was off limits. Aha, I hear you say. So that's how they did it. Throw somebody else's money at the problem and you're bound to get a good result. Not so fast. All that talent was available to every other agency too. No, there was much more to it than that. But first, let's close the tobacco chapter. 
Over a 20-year period, CDP's advertising transformed the Gallagher brand. Eventually, it became the agency's biggest client. from Benson and Hedges. Dear Giles, I'm leaving, with my karate instructor, actually, so don't come running after me. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Why? Why? I suppose we're all looking for something, aren't we, Giles? The yoga's helped a bit, of course, that and the point to point. But what does it all really mean? Live in peace with your pipe. With Mellow Virginia, flake already rubbed. Nothing should disturb that condor moment. The nation's favourite campaign, however, was for Hamlet cigars. Over 130 commercials were produced over a 25-year period. The first was called Music Teacher. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar from Benson and Hedges. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar from Benson and Hedges. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. Hamlet is acknowledged as being one of the most successful campaigns in advertising history. From the outset, the partners were determined that nothing should prevent them from producing outstanding advertising. In Millward, 
Pierce clearly had a special genius. But the most brilliant creative work is pointless if the client won't buy it. Pierce had been there before and knew how dispiriting that was. Determined that that would never happen to him again, he sat down and rewrote the rules of the game. Because more revenue led to greater profits, most agencies welcomed new clients with open arms. Not here, said Pierce. He chose the clients very carefully, selecting only those he felt would be a good fit. The majority of prospective clients were actually declined. But that was just for openers. Agencies usually gave clients alternative campaigns. Not here, said Pierce. The understanding was that for each and every project, CDP would be given sufficient time to apply all its creativity and experience to come up with the best solution. This inevitably was very hard work over several weeks, and at the end of the process, the client was expected to trust CDP's judgment. Account executives' ears rang with the threat, don't come back if the client doesn't approve the ad. Well, occasionally, of course, this happened, and when it did, CDP would start the whole process all over again. After the second attempt, if the client was still unconvinced, the agency reluctantly accepted the fact that, although it had done its very best, the two sides clearly went on the same wavelength. The only sensible course of action was to resign the account. That was unheard of. Nobody did that. So, just to recap Pierce's strategy, step one, select only the most promising clients. Step two, commit to a working partnership based on mutual respect and complete trust in CDP's creative judgment. And step three, because Pierce was nothing if not a shrewd businessman, charge premium fees. The more you charge, the more you valued, the more likely it is the client will accept your advice. CDP's fees were the highest in London. That all sounds very good, doesn't it? But how did it work in practice? Well, before long, the agency won the huge Ford Motor Company account. In many ways, it was the car account to dream for, and a succession of successful campaigns followed for several years. But when a new marketing director arrived from Detroit and demanded alternative campaigns for each new project, Pierce explained that CDP couldn't do that. It spent so much time developing the advertising it presented, it simply didn't have the resources to provide alternatives for the client to pick and choose. The client insisted. Pierce held his ground and resigned the account. Nobody had ever done that to the Ford Motor Company before, and I doubt anyone has ever done it since. For CDP, though, there was a happy ending. Fiat were more than happy to replace Ford, and client and agency agreed that the advertising should convey a distinctly Italian flavour. <laughs> How is marvellous work like that created? Well, you may be surprised to know it isn't the work of one person, but two. From the very beginning, advertising agencies in Britain and America had copy departments and art departments that worked completely independently of each other. If you watch Mad Men, this may not have been explained, but the system worked like this. Account executives worked very closely with the client to produce a brief for the copywriter. The account executives knew exactly what kind of advertising the client wanted, and their job was to deliver it. 
Once the copy was approved, it was sent somewhere else in the building to the art director, who organized photography, layout, design, and so on. There was no working relationship between the copywriter and the art director. For decades, nobody realized that this actually worked against creativity because it produced work that was familiar. Safe ideas that were just more of the same. In other words, client-friendly advertising, profitable but unadventurous. The mold was broken in New York in the 50s by the Doyle Dane Birnbach Agency, where, for the first time, copywriters and art directors were paired to work together as a team. So what was the thinking behind that? Well, copywriters tend to think in a linear, logical way. Art directors and designers think laterally, so put them in the same room and they clash. The result is creative tension. The dictionary defines creative tension as a situation where discord or disagreement ultimately gives rise to better outcomes or ideas. And that's exactly what happened. The two partners challenged and edited each other's suggestions, coming up with ideas that were fresh, witty and arresting. Doyle Den Birnbach was one of the American agencies I mentioned at the very beginning. Pearson Millward even went to New York in 1959 to meet them. They came home determined to start their own very British revolution the next year. Right, so where are we? Let's jump to the mid-60s. All the building blocks are now in place. CDP is five years old. It's powering ahead. Its reputation for such meticulously crafted creative work as to be unchallengeable goes before it. It's now the first British agency to team copywriters and art directors together. It's also the first British agency to put the creative department at the heart of the company. The best creatives are desperate to work there. So are ambitious young account executives. So, it seems, is almost everybody. CDP is changing British advertising by example and has become the go-to agency with an expanding list of clients, big and small. It's a perfect advertising storm. Let's have a look at some early commercials. The relentless gale crashed against Rodney's steel-set brow as Nora, his trusty companion, faltered in exhaustion. His arm, a rod of iron, urged her onward into the raging sleet pounding their coats. Resolutely, they conquered the last tortuous yards. Now, the tense moments of waiting. Suddenly, through the driving hail, a light flickered, drawing closer and closer. Rodney anxiously raised a powerful arm in warm salute, revealing the blast-proof protection of his acrylam warm coat. The acrylam warm coat Look for this label. I won't say goodbye. No, don't say goodbye. Sounds so permanent. It's only for a very short time. Look after yourself. Roast beef, cream potatoes, peas, and Yorkshire pudding. Especially handy for people who aren't used to being on their own. Today is the second anniversary of his operation, so I thought we'd celebrate. I went out and got two pounds of Aberdeen Angus fillet steak, marinated it overnight in olive oil, peppercorns, lemon thyme, crushed garlic, and sliced Spanish onion. And this morning I cut it into strips, dusted them with flour and paprika, fried them in Normandy butter, and put in half a pint of Jersey cream. And he, he hated it. He said he wanted um, this, this stuff. New chunky meat gives your dog the meat 
and other good things he needs in chunks the way he likes it. Coffee, please. You up? Thank you. My goodness, it's very strong. Give it here, I'll bang it under the tap. Well, that's no good. You'll just make it weak and wishy-washy. I think coffee should be mild, but not weak. It should have flavour, but not be too powerful or bitter. All one asks... I know what you're asking for. What? Fine blend instant coffee. I say, do you have fine blend here in this cafe? No. Shall I bang it under the tap? If you like mild coffee, but don't like weak coffee, try new fine blend. I have brought for you our traditional drink. Our country's finest. Thank you very much indeed. Yunika! Mm -hmm. Yunika! Yeah, 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 now you must join me in our country's traditional drink. In my opinion, the best there is. Ah, this Bristol cream, a great sherry. When you can get it. Ash Chem, really? She was a fine old ship. I didn't mention the old bit when I booked my passage. Oh, come off it, sprat old chap. Still, pity she went down before we finished dinner. Missed the liqueurs, what? <laughs> I could have done with a drop myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I might have some rather bad news for some of you. Davis only had time to bring the port. That's my after-dinner tipple, but what about the rest of you? Well, I should say so, sir. <laughs> Cockburns, is it? Cockburns. Oh, <laughs> Cockburns. Very good. <laughs> oh, you mean Coburns. Yes, special reserve. Cockburns. After dinner, a bottle of port is really all you need. Coburn Special Reserve. A very fine bottle of port. Did anyone bring the petty four? Bird's Eye, Coburn's, and five other commercials you'll see later were directed by Alan Parker, a hugely influential figure at CDP, initially as a copywriter, subsequently as a distinguished film director. By 1972, the founders had passed the baton on to a remarkable new duo. John Salmon, acknowledged as one of the finest copywriters of his generation, was installed as creative director. Frank Lowe, a brilliant young account man with a passion for creative work, became managing director. Almost everything you'll enjoy from now on comes from CDP's golden period, the 70s and the early 80s. Remember, successful advertising is all about ideas. Come up with a good idea and you'll not only have a good ad, you'll have the key to a successful campaign that will build up a lasting relationship between advertiser and consumer. The longer the campaign goes on, the more you can push the idea. You can make it fresh, more interesting. You've already seen that with Hamlet. The longer it goes on, the more value it creates. The commercials you're about to see are but a small selection from numerous campaigns that CDP ran for years, making their clients very happy indeed. In 1970, June Whitfield starred in the first of her 14 commercials for Bird's Eye Frozen Foods. The Zablovian ambassador's coming to dinner and the chef's gone off. So I sent out for some Bird's Eye chicken pies. They say you can't tell them from homemade. Same light short crust pastry and lots of good meaty chicken. Of course I shall tell them it's Bird's Eye. Rishna Krasna Kai. Bird's eye chicken pie. It can make a dishonest woman of you. Some women claim bird's eye chicken pie as their own. Can you imagine? Nobody can tell. It tastes just like homemade. Real short crust pastry and lots of plump, tender chicken. I only hope those women can live with themselves. Lots of collection was meant to go to the church with How do you make pastry like this? It's my own recipe. Bird's eye chicken pie. It can make a dishonest woman of you. Tonight I put world's number one detective, Charlie Chan, to the test. I give him bird's eye china dragon, sweet and sour pork, beef chop suey, and crispy pancake rolls, all made to authentic Charlie's recipe. We see if he detect I am not making them myself. 
fast must dispose of evidence. Ah, just as I suspected, the sweet and sour pork. Very nice. Honorable wife made this herself? Chavi Chan, always guess who done it. Bird's eye China Dragon. It can make a dishonest woman of you. Make a dishonest woman of you. What a wonderful idea that is if you're selling food to housewives. I wonder if Bird's Eye were nervous when they approved the campaign. Another long running success was the Heineken Lager campaign. In this simple experiment, we examine the effect of beer on the feet. Now, these feet have been walking all day and are very tired. We see that there is no movement in them, which is due to lack of refreshment. So we administer the cold Heineken. Wait a few seconds, and we observe that the Heineken is already refreshing the feet, causing lively movements of the toes and activating the arches. <laughs> Heineken is the only beer able to do this because it refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. Here in the doctor's surgery, we witness an interesting medical problem. The patient seems to have no reflexes in his left leg. The leg is suffering from a serious deficiency of refreshment. <laughs> but the doctor knows just what to order. He gives his patient a large dose of the cool Heineken. In just a few seconds, the leg is fully refreshed and the reflexes respond normally. Other leg, please. <laughs> of course, one pint is only enough for one leg. Only Heineken can do this because it refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. We have received a number of letters, mainly we imagine from non-beer drinkers, who doubt that Heineken refreshes the path other beers cannot reach. So we have devised this simple test to prove the Heineken claim. All the men, as you can see, are totally exhausted after taking Caesar water skiing this morning. There is not a spark of refreshment in any of them. So we give those on the left the cold Heinekens, and those on the right a selection of other beers popular at the time. Then we strike up the band, and immediately the Heineken has the desired effect on the roars, if not on the boat. Stop! Stop! We're going round in circles! Providing, we believe, conclusive evidence that Heineken truly refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. Today, we are privileged to visit the most exclusive part of the south of France, where we find the world's most successful man. A man who has everything. A superb house, the most beautiful women to attend him, the latest yacht, his personal helicopter, the finest cars. Yet he is bored and dispirited. Life for him is totally lacking refreshment. So, instead of the usual champagne, his butler serves him the cold Heineken. But unfortunately, even the Heineken fails to refresh him. A sad story. But let us all remember, it is better to be a refreshed failure than an unrefreshed success. This sobering thought is brought to you from Heineken, the beer that refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. Usually. The Heineken campaign would probably still be running today if Heineken's competitors, who were taking a terrible beating, hadn't complained that the commercials weren't really tongue-in-cheek. They argued viewers would think the beer had magical powers, and that was dangerous. Anyway, a less controversial national favourite was Hobus. Founded in 1886, the company's history, rooted in northern tradition, inspired the agency. The first commercial, called Bike Ride, directed by Ridley Scott, has been voted the nation's favourite advertisement of all time. The second, called Runaway, was made later by his brother Tony.
last stop on round would be on my Peggy's place. Twas like taking bread to the top of the world. Twas a grand ride back, though. I knew Baker would have kettle on, and doorsteps have on always ready. There's wheat germ in that loaf, he'd say. Get it inside your boy, and you'll be going up that hill as fast as you come down. Though this still has many times more wheat germ than ordinary bread. It's as good for you today as it's always been. I was no more than knee I to a grasshopper when I ran off from home. I packed up my marbles, my catapults, and my obvious sandwiches, and off I went. I just stopped for a bite to eat when up comes postman. Am I in London yet? I asked him. Nay, <laughs> hey, lad, he says. And if thou's thinking of legging it down there, I'll need more of his butter than that to keep thee going. Come back with me, and we'll get thee out and make up a silk case full. Oh, this still has many times more wheat germ than ordinary bread. It's as good for you today as it's always been. Cinzano, on the other hand, was bang up to date with the casting of Leonard Rossiter and Joan Collins. Leonard was a very successful actor with a huge popular following. Joan's career was in the doldrums. So she agreed to shoot the first commercial for a token fee and a first-class return ticket from Hollywood. What a deal that turned out to be. Together, they were fabulous. Oh, those aromatic herbs, and I bet it's made from... Yes, yes, just as I thought, made from the finest Italian rosé wine. Yeah. And it's wet, too. Oh, the best rosé is always on, my dear. Now, from Cinzano, Cinzano rosé. Ah, uh, Melissa! Uh, Mr. Yakitori and his aides? Your croissant. Uh, no, no, sweetie, Japanese. Play this right, there's a scooter each. Oh, we just ordered our traditional drink, Cisano Bianco. Oh, a fusion of superb Italian wines and aromatic herbs. One of our most refined European customs. <laughs> oh! oh. I think they like you, Marissa. Your Cinzano Bianco, signora. Uh, uh, Thank you. Ah, yes, gracias. Ah, do we? No, 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 my Mr. Cinzano as well. Ah, oh, that's better. Uh. Oh, can't you just smell those Italian wines, suffused with herbs, herbs and spices, spices from, from four, four continents. Why, oh, being boring. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. I'm getting your head down, sweetie. Jolly good idea. From the house of Cinzano, Cinzano Bianco. From the moment the campaign broke, Joan's career never looked back. By now you'll understand that CDP's philosophy was to make commercials entertaining and preferably humorous, so that the viewer didn't just remember the product, but actually felt warm about it. An interesting result of this was that actors and comedians who had previously shunned advertising as being beneath them were more than happy to be associated with scripts that were good for their reputations. Dudley Moore. Right, John. I want Bill Smelly and the Stink Bombs, Earwigs, 20 Golden Grapes, Electric Cauliflower Concept Album, Peter Putrid, uh, 20 Greatest Hits, and the Gutter Snipes, latest single. What's the damage, John? Yeah, cool. £24.50. Oh, don't run out of cash, John. Oh, it's all right, we take Barclay Card. Barclay Card, what's that? Uh, that's what he's got. Yeah, it's quite energy, Barclay Card. One day you'll wish you had a Barclay card. Oh. Don't wait for it to arrive. Wherever you bank, apply at any branch of Barclays. Morecambe and Wise. <coughs> oh, hello, Jane. How's it going, boys? Well, I would say we're about halfway there. What time does a match begin? The race starts in five minutes. Ah. Well, I'll have to start without you, Bill Wise. <laughs> and what else have you got to do? Well, we've changed the tyres. Yes. And we've given her a complete respray. What about the petrol? What kind of petrol would you like in there, son? Well, Texaco, of course. Of course. He's right, you can't buy a better petrol. You're not dealing with a mug. Hello! <laughs> we've, uh, we've put some Texaco in so she's ready when you want her. But I can't drive that. It's only half a car. Well, don't worry. You only put half a gallon in. Only <laughs> put half a gallon in. <laughs> you want an engine? <laughs> hey? <laughs> he 
won't go on very far, will you? The two Ronnies. <laughs> there are times when one family car just isn't enough for one family. <laughs> If you find the situation getting on top of you, simply rent a second car from Hertz. It won't make a dent in your wallet. A Ford Fiesta, for example, can be yours the whole weekend from around £28. Wherever you want to go, no one makes renting a car easier than Hertz. Jaws. Dad, that man's eating a fork. Now he's eating a plate. Now he's going to have three shredded wheat. Now don't tell stories. No, two's quite enough for me, thank you. With 100% whole wheat nourishment packed into shredded wheat, who can eat more than two? After low. Mr. Rawlings, your majesty. Her majesty, Mr. Rawlings. Oh. <coughs> your majesty. Mr. Rawlings, we find your tonic water most refreshing, and we have today ordered another bottle. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are intrigued, Mr. Rawlings, as to why it is called Indian tonic water. Tenderly, why do we call it Indian tonic water? Why not? I regret, ma'am, but of necessity that must remain a trade secret. She was not amused. Rawlings, we knew how before. You know who. Now for a musical interlude. A good agency will always be proactive and suggest initiatives to its clients. In 1976, CDP persuaded EMI Records to re-release some of their artists' back catalogue by compiling albums of their greatest hits and advertising them on television. This had never been done before. So it was an experiment and the budget was minimal. But outstanding creativity doesn't depend on spending huge amounts of the client's money and CDP came up with a masterstroke. Why not make the films using existing film library footage which cost virtually nothing? All you have to do is edit. This was the first. EMI bring you the best of the best of the Beach Boys. Beach Boys 20 Golden Greats, 20 tracks for $2.99. Good fun, isn't it? They budgeted to sell 12,000 copies. They sold one and a quarter million in three months. Other albums from other artists followed on equally minuscule budgets. EMI presents three little girls who made it big. and the Supremes. 20 golden greats, 20 beautiful tracks on record or tape. Suddenly, everybody's dancing to a new beat.
It's the disco beat. Twenty great disco sounds from EMI. They were so successful that EMI was confident later on to spend a little more money on this classic. The chimpanzees in the zoos do it. Some courageous kangaroos do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. EMI bring you twenty great love songs from Frank Sinatra. Fly with me, let's fly, let's fly. You make me feel so young You make me feel so spring has sprung It's gonna be so easy For us to fall in love I've got you under my skin When you arouse the need in me My heart says yes indeed in me Let's do it, let's fall in love. Frank Sinatra's 20 Golden Greats, 20 original recordings from Old Blue Eyes himself. I love that, and so did the advertising industry. In 1978, it was voted the best commercial of the year. EMI's financial health, which had been perilous before the campaign started, was transformed. Another low-cost campaign promoted the Daily Express when it changed to a tabloid format in 1977. The paper was pinning its hopes on a revolutionary new marketing technique, the daily serialization of sensational new books before they were available to the general public. CDP's commercials duly delivered. Once upon a time, in a kingdom not a million miles away, there lived a sad princess who, having found her prince charming, wanted to marry him. But the elders of the kingdom deemed that her suitor was not worthy of her. Whereupon he was banished to a faraway land so that he could no longer cast eyes upon the princess. Which of course made the princess very sad indeed. And made her loved one in due course travel the whole world in search of another happy ending. At last, Peter Townsend's own story of his incredible life. Of the events surrounding his fairy tale romance with Princess Margaret. And of the people who finally tore them apart. In the Daily Express all next week. Mr. Hughes wants to go to the bathroom. Right here, Mr. Hughes. If there was anything that Howard Hughes trusted less than people, it was flaws. He thought they were all contaminated. His last 15 years as a total recluse were full of strange quirks like this. Today and all this week in the New Style Daily Express, you can read Howard Hughes, The Hidden Years. The true story of those 15 years revealed by two of his closest aides. You won't believe it until you read it. Even then, you still won't believe it. Ulrika Meinhof was an attractive, successful woman. She was married to a prosperous and respected man. She was the mother of two beautiful daughters. She became a bank robber, arsonist, and killer. She sent her twin daughters at the age of seven to be trained by Palestinian terrorists in Jordan. In fact, they never arrived. They were rescued in time by their father. Ulrika Meinhof was German, but there are plenty of middle-class women terrorists near her home. Rose Dugdale and the girls of the Angry Brigade, to name only a few. This Monday, the Daily Express begins a fascinating report which seeks to explain this frightening phenomenon. The series is written by Bruce Page, who helped disclose the thalidomide scandal. Nobody can afford to miss it.
Get the new style Daily Express and read why ordinary women become terror freaks. Well, we're nearly at the end, and I've chosen a few more gems from the archive. What are we going to order? Better make it something fast. Well, why don't we see if they have any bird's eye beef burgers? They're fast, ready in a jiffy. Delicious, too, especially those new pork burgers. Hey, they got a band. <laughs> Bird's eye beef burgers, when you've got to make it something fast. I can't smile, everybody, please, smile. Waste of time if you haven't taken a light reading. Really. It's all right. This Olympus is completely automatic. It works out the light, and you just click the shutter. Oh, it's OK for snaps, but just you try and enlarge them. You see, the trouble with these small cameras is the lens. No problem. It's a Seiko lens. They use it on the Olympus OM-1, one of the best cameras in the world. Well, I suppose they're all right for you boys, but you wouldn't get a professional using one. Do you know who that is? Who? David Bailey. David Bailey? Who's he? The Olympus trip. So simple, anyone can use it. Well, girls, your last day at the Zermatt School for Young Ladies. Your final and most important important lesson. How to spend daddy's lovely money. Checkbooks open, girls. Pens at the ready. No, 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 Felicity. You couldn't possibly go shopping in Knightsbridge with one of those. A pen with style. A pen with elan. A parker lady in white rolled gold. Knots just seem to roll from its tip. Signatures flow with a flourish. Now then, all together, girls. Yes, Celia? Madame, does one spell pence with an S or a C? I don't think you need worry about that, my dear. The Parker Lady in white roll gold, £9.95. Text and super sound, one simply changes one's set. <laughs> Kathy! You're now, darling. You've got a terrible headache. Radio rentals. You'll be glued to our sets, not stuck with them. Next time you're late for work, it's worth remembering that nothing, that nothing, gets in the way of a Land Rover. The best 4x4. Four by far.
At the time, the surrealist Benson and Hedges commercial was the most expensive ever made. But I prefer to end on an advertisement that cost very little. This little foot will get corns and bunions if a shoe's too tight across here, so Clark's make a range that covers four different widths. And if a shoe only fits up to here, the foot can slide forwards and stub the toes. So Clark's always fit up to here. And if the backs only come up this far, your child could develop claw toes trying to keep the shoe on. So all Clark's shoes cradle the heel completely. And of course, we always make sure there's up to three months growing room in every pair. This is our blueprint. These are our shoes. How could you not buy Clark's shoes for your precious child after that? It was shown on television 40 years ago, and for me, it perfectly defines the intelligence and humanity of the CDP philosophy. And rather like a Hovis loaf, it's as good today as it's always been. Well, we've come to the end, and I imagine you wonder what CDP is doing now. Sadly, it no longer exists. Creative businesses are inherently unstable. They're like amoeba. They're either constantly dividing or being swallowed by a predator. Advertising agencies are particularly fragile. They're vulnerable to a deadly cocktail of ambition, ego, jealousy and greed. CDP fell victim to most, if not all of these at some time or another. It was badly hit by the economic recession in Britain in 1987 and was eventually bought by the huge Japanese agency Dentsu in 1991. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the briefest of glimpses into a remarkable company. If you'd like to know more, contact the History of Advertising Trust. It maintains the National Archive of British Advertising, and it's compiling the CDP archive. They believe it will be the best and most important collection of late 20th century creative advertising that exists in the UK and probably the world. It's a huge job. They're a charity, and they need your support. Thank you.